um, pharmacist and Michael's partner. And I'd just like to introduce Dr. David Hellman. He is a board certified gastroenterologist who's been practicing in the Boynton Beach area for over 17 years. Uh, Dr. Hellman graduated from Nova Southeastern College of Osteopathic Medicine and completed his GI fellowship program at Boxford General Hospital in Farmington Hills, Michigan. His office is located at 10151 Enterprise Center Boulevard, and it's right across the street, actually. So, um, Dr. Hellman. Thank you very much. <laughs> Welcome, everybody. Thank you. So today I'm talking about colon cancer. Uh, it's Colon Cancer Awareness Month, the month of March. So we're going to talk about, uh, a little bit about what we do and why we do what we do, and then we'll take questions at the end. If you want to interrupt me, feel free to just raise your hand and interrupt me anytime. So, we'll talk about the anatomy of the colon. The colon starts out in the rectum here, and uh, this is called the sigmoid colon. It's usually shaped like an S, that's why we call it the sigmoid colon. Then we have the descending colon, the transverse and ascending, and the cecum. So the colon is responsible for taking the waste from the small intestine where all of your um, carbohydrates, fats, and proteins are digested and absorbed, and then all the waste is dumped into the colon in the cecum over here, and that's where the, the stool forms and goes across and comes down before it comes out. And the, and the function of your colon is to reabsorb water, and that's what forms a normal bowel movement. When you have inflammation of the colon, that causes diarrhea because you don't get the proper absorption of the fluids, and you cannot form a normal bowel movement. Colon cancer can occur anywhere in the colon. It's more common to see it in the sigmoid colon, but it can occur anywhere in the colon. This is the colon cancer awareness ribbon. Colon cancer risk, risk factor. So age is a risk factor. We know that after the age of 50, the risk of colon cancer increases. That's why we do screening tests starting at age 50 and then doing them every five to 10 years, depending on what we find. Um, family history is important because if you have a family history of colon cancer, then we start earlier than 50. Uh, personal or family history of colorectal cancer or polyps. So basically, if you have a family history, first degree relative, have colon cancer before the age of 50, we start screening you earlier than 50. If we do a screening colonoscopy and find a polyp in your colon, then we screen you every three years up until you're 80 to 85 years old. Colon polyps are precancerous lesions that can become cancer over time. There's different types of precancerous polyps, so when you have them removed, we look under the microscope, and we're able to determine the percentage of that polyp becoming cancerous over time, and that's why we shore the interval of surveillance. Personal history of inflammatory bowel disease. Um, Anybody with ulcerative colitis or Crohn's disease, which is a chronic inflammatory condition of the colon, increases the risk of colon cancer after you have the disease 10 years. So anybody with ulcerative colitis or Crohn's after the 10 year period from the year of diagnosis, we screen them every three to five years thereafter to remove polyps and look for precancerous lesions. Families of colon cancer, so we talked about this before. Basically, depending on the age, um, if you have a family member, um, first degree family member, mother, father, sister, brother, um, that have colon cancer before the age of 50, that increases your risk significantly. Um, there are genetic um, diseases that people get that can predispose you to colon cancer before the age of 50. Um, these are the inherited syndromes. Familial adenomous polyposis syndrome is the first one. There's a non-polyposis colon cancer known as Lynch syndrome, which runs in families. Turcotte syndrome, Puchieger, and uh, another um, polyposis syndrome. These are all genetic um, conditions that you can be genetically tested for. Racial and ethnic background. Um, Afri African Americans have a slightly higher risk of colon cancer the American Cancer Society um, changed the screening to 45 years old in Afro Americans in the last couple of years. So they, we screened them five years earlier than the average population. And the Jews of Eastern European descent um, have a DNA um, 
change mutation in 6% of American Jews, so those people are at higher risk as well for colon cancer. Type 2 diabetes, um, increased risk of colon cancer. I think it has a lot to do with also obesity. Um, people that, uh, you know, we say you are what you eat, which is true. A lot of people with type 2 diabetes are, are diet dependent. People are usually overweight. They have central obesity, very large stomachs, and they have an increased risk of colon cancer. Um, certain types of diet, primarily uh, high fat content diets. Um, we know that um, Asian populations, people that live in uh, China, Hong Kong, have a very low incidence of colon cancer. But when they move to this country, they develop the same incidence as we do, and we think it's more of a uh, um, the diet. The, the Asian people eat a lot of vegetables and fruits and salads, eat a very low fat diet. We eat a very high fat diet here, and we think that has something to do with it. Physical inactivity, again, people that are overweight, they're not active, are at a slight increased risk of colon cancer, smoking, and heavy alcohol abuse. Importance of screening. Um, again, colon cancer is the third most common cause of cancer in America. A new case of colon cancer, over 100,000 a year, um, 40,000 cases of rectal cancer. The difference between colon and colorectal is with the location. When the cancer is in the rectum, um, anatomically there's a high vascular um, innervation there, and the treatment is different. When, when you have cancer in the rectum, it's usually more serious. Um, the metastatic disease is higher, and the treatment is different. That's what um, Farrah Fawcett had. She had the rectal. Um, she did not believe in conventional therapy. We generally give chemotherapy radiation first before surgery. And people that don't want to get chemo radiation first, um, they're, you know, when you go right to surgery after, you know, before that, the, uh, the risk of, of dying is a lot higher. So she didn't opt for that. She went out of the country, and that's why she died, uh, strictly because she didn't listen to the doctors here, unfortunately. Early detection is very important. Um, again, we talked about the polyps. Polyps are, can be precancerous. There are non-precancerous polyps and precancerous polyps. The non-precancer are called hyperplastic polyps. The cancerous polyps are, are, are called adenomatous polyps. And there's different types of adenomatous polyps that carry a higher risk of cancer. So anytime I remove a polyp, I send it to the pathologist, and then the patients follow up in the office to discuss the type of polyp they have, and then depending on the pathology, determines the follow-up. We generally do them every two or three years if we do find a precancerous polyp. If someone on the first time has more than 10 or 15 polyps, then I usually scope them within a year a second time to make sure I didn't miss any um, and, and be complete and make sure that their colon's clean. Over 90% of colon cancers, uh, people that are diagnosed, if you find the cancer early, and that's why screening is so important, the, the stage one cancers, the, the, the five-year survival is 90%. And the way we stage people with colon cancer is the size of the tumor, the depth of penetration in the wall of the colon, if any lymph nodes are positive, and if the cancer has gone to any other organs of the body. So it's either stage one, two, three, or four. So stage one, there's no lymph nodes involved. When you have lymph nodes involved, it's stage two. And when it goes to a distant organ, it's stage four. So that determines the treatment after surgery in all colon cancer. So the key to treating and curing colon cancer is early detection. You threw in a <clears throat> nice picture of <laughs> overweight. <laughs> 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 Slide presentation here is different than the I one know, you sure. gave me two, and this is totally different than, <laughs> than all the <laughs> That's okay. We get beyond it. I'm not computer savvy. Uh, I think you're doing great. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a PC.
seen kind of guy. Yeah. That's a Mac. Bring my 12 year old in, he could fix it, no problem. <laughs> so could your three year old? Yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> Unless that's the end of the, of the talk, I can. Uh, I was, I was winging. looking at seeing what, what else, because I pretty much covered everything, but I could talk about more stuff. But just see. <laughs> Pretty much, that, and that may be the end. I, I don't know because I didn't. See, I didn't get. I know. I had a different paper yet. Oh, that may be the other slide. Could that be the last oh, slide? Oh, possibly. There were two. Good question. Yes. When you um, discover polyps in the colon, yes, you remove them. Correct? Yes. Yes. The polyps can come in different sizes. We have very, very small ones and very, very large ones. So. I can remove them either with a biopsy forceps, which is like a pair of tweezers. We have something called a snare, which is a wire that we hook up to heat and cordery, and we actually can burn a polyp off at the base. Now, there's two types of polyps. There's pedunculated polyps and sessile polyps. It has to do with how they're attached to the colon. Mm -hmm. The sessile polyps are like a bush. They're flat and broad-based. The pedunculated polyps are like a tree. They have a trunk. So the, the ones with the trunk, they're easy to remove because you just lasso and you get to the base and you remove it. When they're like a bush, a little bit harder because there's a lot more surface area that the colon's attached to. So there's a higher rate of bleeding and perforation. So when we do colonoscopies, the risks are bleeding, perforation, infection, and bleeding. So all those things go up when the polyp is larger and more broad-based. Um, Sometimes we inject the polyp with saline to lift it off so you can remove it. Sometimes we remove it in piecemeal or sometimes we can't remove it. So we take a piece of it, just a part of it, look under the microscope, and then sometimes I'll tattoo the area for the surgeon and then they'll go to surgery to remove the polyp if it's too big to be removed. Very good question. Um, also, the difference between colonoscopy and all the different variations, you know, flexible sigmoidoscopy means that we only look at the lower third of the colon. That's a flexible sigmoidoscopy. The colonoscopy is we look at the entire colon with a scope. A barium enema is when we put contrast in, it's a radiology test, they put a balloon in your rectum and they put air and contrast in your colon and then they can take an x-ray of your colon when they put the film on the outside of the bowel wall to look for polyps and lesions. Sometimes when we do a colonoscopy we can't get through all the way. Some people have very tortuous colons, meaning they're very twisted. Some people have, have had pelvic or abdominal surgery, so you have adhesions and scar tissue, so it makes it difficult to complete a colonoscopy, so then we have to do a barium enema to follow if we can't complete it to look at the remainder of the colon. We also have a, a virtual colonoscopy, which is a three-dimensional CAT scan reproduction of a colonoscopy. You still have to take the prep to clean out for all the tests, and then you go under a CAT scan machine and they do a three-dimensional um, reproduction actually on a three-dimensional view of the colon, but if they find a polyp or growth, it needs to be removed, and then you have to have a colonoscopy. How about the pill that you swallow and does the whole? Right, the pill camera is used for small bowel. We we use it. It's designed only looking at the small bowel presently. So, if someone presents to me with anemia or um, low blood count, and we do an upper and a lower endoscopy, and we can't find the source of bleeding, then we do the pill cam. It's a small camera in a pill. It was designed by the Israelis, and actually you swallow the pill, and the pill goes into the esophagus, stomach, into the small bowel. You wear a little device on your belt, so then the camera is feeding all the pictures to your um, belt, and then you, you wear the, the little thing on your belt all day, and the pill takes a few hours to get through the small intestine, and takes pictures as it's going through, and then you go back to the doctor at the end of the day, you drop off your little um, device, the transmitter, and then you download it on the computer, and then you can actually watch um, the, the camera, the movie, of the pill going through the small intestine. The small bowel is between 30 and 40 feet long. Um, and the, the risk of cancer of your small bowel is very, very small, less than 3% of the time that the, you can ever get cancer in your small intestine. Very uncommon. A liar. <laughs> <laughs> is there more? No, it, do, is it like looks like we, we got to the end. We got to the end. I guess they just have some nice pictures to yeah, look at. Yeah, yeah, you know what? It was. It that was the last one. Another question. Yes. <laughs> um, I happen to um, have Barrett's esophagus. Okay. I have had two 
um, stage two displays, dysplasia okay. uh, areas, yes. and they were surgically uh, corrected. Okay. And um, I had to have um, um, endoscopies every four months for a year, and then every six months for two years, and then every year for like five years, and now I'm on every two years, right? Which is nice. Yes. But when you now that means that the potential is in my body. It must be in my DNA someplace. No, the the, no. the, the cause of Barrett's is from chronic reflux. Yes. We know that people that have chronic reflux, esophagitis, the acid from your stomach, I had surgery for that too. Right, bathes the lower esophagus, and the mucosa is different. The lining of the esophagus is different than the lining of the stomach. Right. So what happens is, is your body's natural mechanism, actually your gastric mucosa grows up into your esophagus to protect it. But in doing that, it causes dysplasia, it causes a change, which increases the risk of cancer of the lower yeah. esophagus. So anyone with Barrett's, that means that the gastric mucosa has grown into the esophagus, that increased risk of cancer. So the dysplasia meant that it looked like things were starting to become cancer. Right. That's why they kept biopsying you and looking for the cancer. They never right. found the cancer because they were it wasn't they, there. right. They wasn't there yet. But the fact of what they did, whether they ablated you or you know, whatever they did, laser or surgically did, yeah. where there's a lot of different application. Right. So there's a lot of different procedures that they can do to yeah. to fix that. Yeah. But once you have it, then you have to be You're aware of and, and you have to have uh, surveillance. Right. Constantly. Right. Yes. As a gastro doctor, is there any vitamin or supplement that you recommend that people take to lessen the chance of colon cancer? Well, there's been a lot of studies out. I mean, a line is a, is a probiotic. Talk about probiotics being important. Um, some studies show that uh, aspirin, aspirin, some people say that a non anti-inflammatory. There's a lot of studies out that have talked about a lot of different things that have potentially decreased colon cancer. You know, I'm not sure that there was enough people in the study, and I don't know how many other studies have confirmed that. But I think the most important thing is to eat healthy and to exercise, get enough sleep, and to get your colonoscopy at age, you know, between 50 and 55, you should get your first one. Um, you know, the sooner the better, especially if you have a family history of polyps or <coughs> colon cancer. Um, some people wait till 55 or 60. I know a lot of people that do that, as long as you're not having any symptoms. If you have symptoms before 50, if you're having rectal bleeding, abdominal pain, diarrhea, I mean, I didn't talk about the, the we call the red flag signs of colon cancer, which is unexplained weight loss, unexplained anemia, blood in the stool, a change in bowel habits. Um, so those are things that we look for. I'm sure all of you that go to your primary care doctor, they do you know complete blood count. They give you a stool to take home to check for blood and always ask you about your bowel habits. Have you lost weight unexpectedly? So those are all things that... Um, sometimes you can get colon cancer and those are the silent things because unfortunately when you have pain the, the tumor is usually pretty big um, especially if you have a right-sided tumor um, it could cause almost total obstruction and have no symptoms till you're totally obstructed when the lesions on the, in the sigmoid colon close to your rectum and your stool is more formed usually as you, a cancer grows it doesn't need to be as big before you see a change sometimes you see your bowels are more narrowed um, you may, they may be darker because you're bleeding, so some blood mixed with the stool makes it darker in color. Um, you may have less bowel movements, less frequently. So there's a lot of different symptoms that people have, and it can be subtle in the beginning, but as long as you go to the doctor and, and be seen and, and screening is very, very important. That's why we talk about it so much. How frequently should one have a colonoscopy? Um, if, you have, if you have no family history and no polyps and you're clean, um, at, at, at 50, uh, Minimum of five years, maximum of ten years in that range. Yes. Does uh, having colitis increase your risk of colitis? Yes, cancer? yes. Anybody with any inflammatory colitis, which is ulcerative colitis, Crohn's colitis, this lymphocytic colitis, those chronic inflammatory conditions of the colon increases the risk of cancer of the colon. Absolutely. Usually it takes about ten years, so then we screen people that have ulcerative ulcer colitis or Crohn's, once they have the disease 10 years, even though we treat them and we keep them in remission, then we start um, scoping them every two to three years until they're 80 to 85. Yes? Once you take acid, okay, um, 
even though you get regurgitation, it, it cuts down the acid. In well, the treatment, you know, reflux disease means that the acid from your stomach is coming up into your esophagus. Mm -hmm. So by taking the medication, you're not, it doesn't stop what's happening, it just changes the pH. Okay. So the acid, which is a low pH, <coughs> the medication increases it to more basic, 7.5 mm -hmm. or higher. So the, the, the stuff's still coming up, but because it's more basic, that the damage is not being done. So that's the, that's the treatment in the medication. But as far as food, we know that food increases reflux, which is caffeine, chocolate, peppermint, tomato-based foods, fried food, fatty food, citrus, and alcohol. All those things increase reflux. So I tell all my patients to stop those things, and they tell me there's nothing else to eat. <laughs> That's all I, I give them. I give you a list of what leads to it. <laughs> so, I, I, I run off that list yeah, a thousand that times, and I get at least every five times people look at me and say, Well, there's nothing else to, to eat. They're, they're either Italian or Jewish because they, you know, with Italian food and going out to eat all the time. Yeah. <laughs> If you're Jewish, you had sour cream and fat since you were born. That's right. <laughs> the Italians are all about the sauce. <laughs> well, tomatoes don't bother me. They really don't. But, but what they I do is all, anything yeah, with fat. all the foods yeah, that I mentioned, what they sense. do is they decrease this. The, you have a sphincter, a lower esophageal sphincter, mm -hmm. that is the door that opens and closes of the esophagus and stomach. And those foods allow that sphincter to relax more and allow the door to be open more. So that's why you get more reflux with those foods. And certain foods trigger certain people more than others. So mm -hmm. some people the caffeine may trigger, some people it's the citrus, some people it's the alcohol, some people it's the peppermint, mm -hmm. or the Gosh, caffeine. Right? Mm -hmm. Well, that's a, that's a New Jersey term for hard work. <laughs> <laughs> I learned that the hard way. Somebody came in and off said, I, oh, I have agita. 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 Oh, that's Italian. Yeah. Agita. I've heard people describe their heartburn as agita. Yeah. Any other questions? Thank you very okay. much for coming and enjoy. Thank you. Thank you.